Welcome to The Blast Zone, the podcast where we dig up the bombs that shook Hollywood and try to find out why they went up in flames. This week, X marks the bomb. This is Cutthroat Island. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Blast Zone. Welcome to The Blast Zone. We are not a podcast about bad movies. We are a podcast about movies that did badly. That's right. I'm John Drake, in-house film critic of my Letterboxd account. And I'm Ian Dukes. I'm a person with thoughts and feelings, and some of them are about movies. Movies like Cutthroat Island, which we'll be talking about today. But before we get into that... Ian, after a week off, how are you feeling? Since we last talked, I've had a lot of highs and lows. I'm going to talk about one of the highs. I went out for not one, but two nice dinners at fancy restaurants since we last spoke. And that may not sound like much to people, but it's twice as many dinners out as I've had for the past three years combined. So it felt like a big deal to me. I used to have more good food and fine dining experiences in my life. So it was nice to get out and remember what that was like. I was like, wow, what is this? How did I get here and <laughs> enjoyed a couple good meals and it was nice. So those were good things that I will focus on this week. I understand why you have not been going out for dinners. Obviously, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the world, mm-hmm. but I can't imagine living in LA and just not taking advantage of any of the restaurants that you have. <laughs> there's a lot of good ones, funny enough. Yeah. It's quite a food town, you know, LA. Yeah, I had some great Mediterranean and some great Southeast Asian fusion cuisine. I can't go into it all, but it's great. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been out to a fancy restaurant. Although me and my wife have a reservation tomorrow for some good Spanish food. We're going to get some nice Ooh, charred octopus, that. one of our favorite things. Cool. I'm excited about that. But uh, everyone in my house has been sick to some degree for the last like month. So Bummer. we're uh, finally starting to feel better, which is uh, going a long way to making me feel better. It's the winter. It gets dark at like 345 all of a sudden. It's yeah. cold as shit. Not the best recipe for your mental health. And then you got to watch movies like Cutthroat Island and uh, <laughs> talk about them for two hours. All in all, not a recipe <laughs> for the best feelings, but we're going to power through. We're going to make it happen. Yeah. And before we do that, what did you happen to watch this week that you wanted to share? with the listeners. So our last episode was Children of Men. And after that episode, I was like, I love Alfonso Cuaron. I dig this dude. I should go back and revisit Gravity because I remember watching Gravity and being like, eh, I don't know what I felt about it. I wanted to see if I would appreciate it more. I did. I was less caught up by the spectacle this time, less scared by the space fear. Like, you're constantly like, afraid in that movie of asphyxiating and flying off into space. So like- Not was, you like, personally. Nothing's going to happen to you. No, but I mean, you know, if you get involved with the characters, but I was at a little more cool emotional distance this time, so it was easier to appreciate the mechanics of the movie. It's interesting. Just like Children of Men, it was an adventure where you had to get from A to B, and it had a whole bunch of progressive plot escalations to make it harder and harder to get from A to B. But it's even simpler. It felt like Coron was saying, Children of Men work pretty good. What happens if I strip the story down even more, strip the characters down? It's just going to be two people in my movie, and then like ramp up the visuals so it's all spectacle, all this intense plot stuff, and then this little nugget of internal drama going on at the same time and see if that works. It worked for him. He made a ton of money. He got Best Director. Mm-hmm. So what can I say? His little experiment paid off. Yeah, almost $800 million worldwide, I think, that movie took wow. out, which is pretty astonishing. Such a relatively small movie yeah. when you really consider what it's about and what happens in it that to captivate that many people. But I liked it on first viewing. It's definitely not my favorite Quaron, but maybe I'll give it another shot too because what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But we also know that Ian is textbook. If he watches something twice, he automatically likes it like 30% <laughs> more. That's true. That's so. true. He got my free bump. You got the Ian bump, the Duke's bump, if you will. Yeah. I watched something also prestigious, awards baity, okay. but more recent. I checked out the movie She Said, which is the dramatization of the New York Times investigation into the Harvey Weinstein sexual yes. assault, harassment, rape scandals multiple, right. over decades and decades. And uh, it was a very good movie, well-made movie. I guess competently made is the best way to describe it. It's not flashy. Uh, okay. It's very narratively focused. It's procedural, much like Spotlight was, but I don't know. It all feels a little little masturbatory for like Hollywood to go in and make a prestige drama they're hoping will win awards about a scandal that apparently most of Hollywood was fully aware of for decades and did nothing to stop or even curb the behavior involved. Yeah. Doesn't that strike you as a bit like pat yourself on the back? (laughs) Exactly. I was just thinking that if it comes full circle and then they actually pat themselves on the back for celebrating these reporters, that could be seen as a little bit grotesque. And that's not the filmmakers fault. Like the filmmakers personally were not the ones (laughs) ignoring these 
scandals, but like the buzz it's getting, it also bombed super hard. We could talk about it more in depth one day. Potentially we will. It just, I struggle with these kind of grand retrospectives on events that still feel so current. Like the whole Weinstein thing, if you were following Hollywood to any degree, like there's nothing in there you don't know already. And there's really not enough perspective on what came after to give it a more interesting angle. We still don't really know what the ramifications of Me Too are fully going to be. Certainly there was a lot of individuals that were outed as monsters and creeps and some were not blacklisted necessarily, but I certainly don't want to use the word canceled. Lost their status. Yes. Some of them lost their status and are maybe still working in a reduced rate. Some aren't working at all, but from a more grand scale, from a more big picture point of view, like what did this all mean and what did it all do? I think it's still too soon to really know. So why are we making this movie now? That's a good question. I think from a thoroughly postmodern perspective, it may not be a good excuse, but I think there's an excuse for these kind of films because it's just like films are one way we figure out what just happened, right? Like I lived through that. I think I remember how it went down. I could go back and try to find a New Yorker or Esquire article explainer on what happened, or I could watch a dramatization of it. And I think a lot of people are like, let me just watch a drama version and cement what went down five years ago. And you're right. It's like, it's a little too soon to have a lot of perspective or be meaningful, but it seems like for better or worse, those movies have a somewhat practical function in our lives. That's true. I might be looking at it through the lens of somebody who followed the trades and movie news around that time and was right. pretty tuned into what was going on and every new piece of information that came out, I was grabbing as it was released either on Vulture or the AV Club or whatever okay. I was reporting on it at the time. But I recognize that's probably not how most moviegoers view the industry. Yeah. They're much more casual onlookers and something really needs to be in their face for them to take notice of it. You know, this didn't involve a movie that was coming up or exactly. even really like there's a reason for this, but like Ashley Judd, Gwyneth Paltrow and Rose McGowan were not huge Hollywood stars when this article came out. And a lot of that is due to the fact that they did refuse Harvey Weinstein's advances and or right. tell their story about it, which led to them being punished for that, much like we talked about in the Mira Sorvino episode. Yeah. So for a casual moviegoer, there wasn't a lot to draw you into that story at the time, unless you were tuned into the more behind the scenes aspects of Hollywood, who did not do great business at the box office. But it's available for streaming now already. Oh. That's like the new normal now. If a movie doesn't do what you want, you don't wait the 90 day window anymore. You just drop it on streaming as soon as possible. Well, there's still a conversation about it going on. Yeah. Speaking of bombs, we got to talk about Cutthroat Island, the Guinness Book of World Records holder for the biggest bomb of all time for a while, I think until John Carter hit the scene. Okay. So this is a doozy. This is a hundred million dollar club. And wouldn't you know it, neither of us had ever seen it before this. You had barely even heard of it. Isn't that weird? I was at an age when this came out that I certainly could have heard about it, but I guess it speaks to the impression it made on the general public. The poster image was familiar. It's got these nice (laughs) renditions of Gina Davis and Matthew Modine. It's a very nice swashbuckling image. So that was familiar, kind of stuck in my head, but I can't remember ever really giving a thought to this movie or it being something anyone talked about, either when it came out or on home video. Like this is one that certainly would make an interesting box cover to pick up down at Video Journeys on VHS back in the day, but I don't think it ever made it home. This is kind of a ghost to me. Yeah, I was nine years old when this movie came out. That's probably a little too young for the target audience here, but then like for this movie, movie that cost $115 million to make to just come and go. And I'd like, it never really got brought up until decades later when I bought a book about movies that flopped that I referenced on the podcast before by Nathan Rabin. Mm -hmm. And there was a chapter on Cutthroat Island. I was like, this feels like one of those movies within a movie that they make up for like Tropic Thunder or something. Cause this shit sounds (laughs) made up as hell. Gina Davis and Matthew Modine and $115 million (laughs) swashbuckling pirate adventure. Fuck out of here. It's not a real movie, but (laughs) lo and behold, it is, it exists. And we have to talk about it now. Get ready. Buckle your swashbuckling washes, folks. Oh, boy. So, I mean, that kind of answers the question. I usually like to ask, what was your relationship to the film before today's episode? Neither of us really had one. Coming into it cold and like for all its big numbers that it carries, it doesn't even have the cultural cachet of an Ishtar or Waterworld. Waterworld or one of those like really notorious stinkers that people go, oh yeah, you got to see that just to mock the people who lost their fortunes on it. It's bizarre. This movie came out only five months after Waterworld because this feels like a movie that's at least five years older than Waterworld. I don't know if you got the same vibe, but it feels feels older than 1995 when you watch it. It does. I was thinking the exact same thing. I mean, there's. it makes sense. Waterworld was futuristic sci-fi and this is trying to be retro. It's trying to capitalize on some nostalgia for swashbuckling adventure, which clearly the public wasn't into in 1995, but it does feel like it has a lot of 80s vibe to it. I do still consider Waterworld a pirate movie though. Would you concur? I'm fine with throwing it in there. It's definitely a certain brand of piracy, but not like this movie is just absolutely by the book yes. from the 
locations and the characters and the, every little thing. They worked everything they could think of into it that would be piratey. Lord, didn't they? We'll get into that more. <laughs> but uh, do you want to hear about the making of this movie? Because the making of this movie is far and away more interesting than this movie. Yeah, let's hear how this thing happened. <clears throat> Let me take a sip of my beverage because this is a long one. Please. Waterworld. Definitely a pirate movie. Treasure Planet. Hook. Pirates, Nathan Hayes, Yellowbeard, The Princess Bride, Muppet Treasure Island, Master and Commander. Pirate movies tend to bomb or at least disappoint at the box office, but Rennie Harlan was going to change all that. Harlan broke onto the scene with Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, a pretty terrible Elm Street movie that still managed to make a bunch of money. In a strange twist of fate, he had two movies released in back-to-back weeks in July of 1990, the critical and commercial hit Die Hard 2 on July 4th, and the absolute failure Andrew Dice Clay quote-unquote comedy, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, a week later on July 11th. Sometimes a movie's failure is simply a roll of the dice. He seemed to get a pass for Fairlane because Die Hard 2 was such a success, and he had another action hit in 1983 with Cliffhanger. 1993 would also be the year he married Gina Davis, an established movie star after her turns in The Fly, Beetlejuice, Thelma and Louise, and A League of Their Own. Harlan's next project would be the ambitious pirate action comedy Cutthroat Island, which would feature a female lead, which was unfortunately noteworthy at the time. Harlan knew just who to cast, hoping to help his new bride become a bona fide action star. He convinced producer Mario Casar to cast Davis in the lead and secured a $60 million budget from beleaguered production house Kuroko, which was deeply in debt at the time and on the verge of bankruptcy. The studio essentially bet its survival on the success of the movie, canceling its only other project in production at the time, the Arnold Schwarzenegger historical epic Crusade, which was to be directed by Paul Verhoeven. It also sold its interest in Showgirls, Last of the Dogmen, and Stargate. With Davis secured as the lead role of Morgan Adams, Harlan turned his energy to finding her male co-star, a task which proved difficult. Michael Douglas initially agreed to star as William Shaw, but he had demands. He wanted to start filming immediately, and he wanted equal screen time with Davis. Douglas would back out of the project after claiming Davis's role was being expanded throughout pre-production, and Davis also actually tried to back out at this point, but her contract was ironclad and she was forced to stay on. Yeah, it said, till death do us part. After Douglas dropped out, Harlan was busy trying to find a male lead to replace him, and set construction and script rewrites were being done without his oversight. So when shooting was about to begin and Harlan finally saw the sets and the script, he ordered rebuilding and rewriting, ballooning the film's budget and pushing back its timeline. Harlan did also put up a million dollars of his own money to get the script rewritten. Every white actor in Hollywood was offered the part of William Shaw, including but not limited to Tom Cruise, Keanu Reeves, Russell Crowe, Liam Neeson, Jeff Bridges, Ray Fiennes, Charlie Sheen, Michael Keaton, Tim Robbins, Gabriel Byrne, and even fucking Daniel Day-Lewis. I drink your grog shake. But the project already had bad buzz and they all turned it down. Matthew Modine, a fine actor who had starred in some great films but was not exactly a box office draw, accepted the role partially due to the fact that he had experience as a fencer. With production finally getting underway in Malta and Thailand, Harlan quickly developed a reputation as kind of a dick. He fired his chief camera operator after an argument, leading to the resignation of over two dozen crew members. Personalities weren't the only problems, though, as broken pipes led to raw sewage filling up the water tanks. Yum! The film cinematographer Oliver Wood would fall off a crane and break his leg one week into production, having to be replaced by Peter Levy. He was like, next time, just wish me good luck. The film's budget was now nearing $100 million, though some estimate it ended up costing about $115 million to produce. The film would have to be a massive hit to break even. A huge marketing push would help with that, but the film's distributor, MGM, was in the process of being sold and was unable to devote a proper marketing budget. Set for a blockbuster Christmas release of December 22nd, 1995, the movie came and went with a massive thud, opening up in 11th place with only $2.3 million its opening weekend. It wasn't helped by negative reviews as the film sits at 39% on Rotten Tomatoes. Some of the other films that opened that week and beat it include Waiting to Exhale, Grumpier Old Men, Sudden Death, Tom and Huck, and Dracula Dead and Loving It. The combined budget of all those movies was about $115 million, by the way. This movie was dead and hating it. Cutthroat would actually make more money in its second week, earning $2.8 million, but it would plummet to 18th place in its third week, making only $775,000. Only about five months after Waterworld, we had a new biggest box office bomb of all time as it pulled in just about 10 million dollars against its massive budget but hey it was in the guinness book of world records for a while davis and harlan would go on to make the long kiss goodnight in 1996 a movie that rules but wasn't exactly a hit 
and Davis would file for divorce from Harlan on August 26, 1997, one day after Davis's personal assistant, Tiffany Brown, gave birth to a child fathered by Harlan. Cutthroat lost about $140 million total and is blamed for setting back women-led action movies for years, along with the Charlize Theron bomb, Aeon Flux. But the film is having something of a renaissance with younger filmgoers discovering it now and building a small but devoted cult fan base. Wow, that relationship didn't last long. Quite traumatic. Were they married long before this? They were married in 93, I think I mentioned in the early stage of the monologue. Oh, so okay. this movie went into production pretty soon after they got married. A lot of their marriage was just this movie. Right, because it was in production forever. And then one more, and then they were done. I saw Gina Davis giving press interviews about this movie, and she already had the blonde hair from Long Kiss Goodnight. So like those were back to back, I guess. Yeah, the press tour of this, I believe, bled into the pre-release schedule for Long Kiss Goodnight. Night, but Long Kiss Goodnight is actually a really fun movie. I quite enjoy that one. Yeah, I'm going to have to check it out. I think you recommended it to me before and I saw like the first 30 minutes, which sometimes happens to me. I'm going to go back. Rennie Harlan surely comes off like the villain in that monologue in the Gina Davis and Rennie Harlan marriage for obvious reasons. He did a yeah. very shitty thing. But there was some reports that Davis was a bit of a diva on set too. She didn't get away entirely unscathed. Uh, okay. I have a little anecdote from Matthew Modine here that I would like to read you. Please. Matthew Modine seems like a pretty level-headed guy, so I don't think he's just trying to stir up shit here. He said that some of the reasons that the budget ran out of control, some of them were related to the production. Like he said, Harlan always had three cameras rolling at the same time to get multiple angles for every shot. But also, Harlan and Davis had cases of V8 vegetable juice shipped out to the set in Malta just for the two of them, because I guess it's not readily available in Malta. But then that shit costs money, and that goes into the production budget. And when they were cleaning up the set after... After the last day of filming, they found like a storage room just filled to the brim with V8 vegetable juice. Like they were ordering it and never drinking it. Uh, Man, like, like how much do you have to order over what stretch of time to fill up a storage room with V8? And who's going to drink all that shit, man? You drink half a can and you're like, look, I got to stop. It's got that tinny flavor. They don't even bother exactly. trying to treat the insides of the cans they use to yeah, that's like, get rid of that grossness. Half the flavor of V8 is the can. What a weird drink. Yeah, it's so strange. I've never been able to stomach it. I don't even like Bloody Marys because they remind me of V8. Yeah. It's like from from a time before people knew what vegetables tasted like. And they're just like, I right. guess this is vegetables. There's a picture of them on the can. <laughs> right. So yeah, pretty chaotic a production, obviously. Maybe not to the degree that like Waterworld was or something like Heaven's Gate. But the, the writing was on the wall during production, I'm sure, for the cast and crew that there was a bit of a circus going on here. It's such a weird thing because like you said, the production company, Carolco, Coralco, I don't, I've never known how to pronounce that, but they were like in trouble. So I get it. I get the narrowing down. Okay, we got to cut Verhoeven and Schwarzenegger loose. I mean, there's plenty of reasons probably to cut Paul Verhoeven loose if you're not totally in sync with him on making your movie. But then to just keep doubling down to go, yeah, we're in trouble, but we really have to spend as much money as we can possibly imagine on this movie rather than we're in trouble. Let's maybe talk to Harlan and slim this movie down and not build innumerable real wooden ships and explode them all off the coast of Malta. Like there was no expense spared in making this movie and uh, maybe there should have been. All right, John Hammond. I think we're glossing over the fact that they canceled a Arnold Schwarzenegger historical action epic in 1993 to make the Gina Davis and Matthew Modine pirate adventure. That duo made fucking Total Recall, Verhoeven and Schwarzenegger, which was a pretty massive hit at the time. And that was only three years prior to this decision to cancel their movie and fund Cutthroat Island. That's an excellent point. If you're like, we need a guaranteed hit, Arnold was probably more like your guy at that point. I guess I immediately leapt to the idea that there was all kinds of troubles with that movie, although I know nothing about its production. Why is Verhoeven difficult to work with? I've heard things. <laughs> we'll talk more about Verhoeven in upcoming episodes. He's got quite a few movies that qualify for this podcast. So Fun. fear not, we can dive more into his comings and goings later. It's a strange thing because Gina Davis was much more of a prestige star at this time, I would say. Okay. She wasn't like, she wasn't known as the popcorn action star. A League of Their Own was a sleeper hit. I don't think people really expected such big things from it and it ended up being a pretty big cultural moment. And that movie was fucking great. I love the League of Their Own, but- you know, that's very much an ensemble too. Yeah. And Tom Hanks, even though he's definitely not really the star of that movie, got top billing because he's Tom Hanks. So I don't know if, if she'd opened a movie on her own that could qualify her as like a bankable star at this point. And Modine, like, he was more of a character guy yeah. at this stage of his career. He always has been really. He's never had a leading man phase. Yeah. Like you said, they worked their way down the ladder. They were trying to get all kinds of fig names that could open movies and they couldn't keep one. But Modine with the floppy blonde hair and a little mustache and a little goatee, does he remind you of anyone? from another famous pirate movie? You 
brought up the Princess Bride and he's got a Carrie Elwes vibe for sure in this. He's got some real Wesley vibes, just yeah. his appearance alone, but also his demeanor. He's got that kind of devil may care, swashbuckling, never do well going on. Very dry, always cool and detached and quippy. And it's fun. For me, Modine was one of the highlights of this movie. I will probably say it more than once. I wanted more of him. I think both the leads are pretty good in this. I enjoyed Davis in it too. I think she's a very underrated actor. But in a lot of ways, this is like the most simplistic pirate story you could tell. We're trying to find a treasure map so we can go find some treasure. Yeah. And there's other people that want the treasure too. And we got to get there first. That's like the most basic ass pirate storyline you could think of. But then there's so much other shit in this movie that's completely unnecessary and just loads the runtime and over complicates things that we'll have to talk about as it comes up. It's a big fat movie and nothing strikes you as weird. It's just, oh yeah, here we go. Here's all this and here's all that. And it's very gussied up Hollywood style. So you can see the budget that they poured into making the most of all the old cliches that they wanted to hammer on. But you end up coming out of it going, okay, do we need that? I get why swashbuckling adventure is a fun genre, but like, why do we just invest all that effort into this? And the movie never quite gives you a reason. Let's start going through the story and we can maybe try to surmise a reason. All right, here we go. It is the 17th century. Morgan Adams, played by Gina Davis, is a plucky lady pirate. A bad pirate named Dog Brown, played by Frank Langella, kills Morgan's father, the pirate captain, Black Harry Adams. But Morgan gets away with a partial treasure map that Dog was after. One piece out of three, which when put together, will show the way to a legendary treasure of Spanish gold hidden on Cutthroat Island. Now captain of her father's ship, Morgan comes ashore at Port Royal, Jamaica and purchases an enslaved white man named Shaw, played by Matthew Modine, who she thinks can help her translate her map. But Morgan has a bounty on her head, and when she's recognized, she's forced to make a dramatic escape from the forces of Governor Ainsley and his man, Captain Trotter, who continue in pursuit of Morgan and the fabled treasure. So I think the first thing you notice once this movie gets going is that, like you said, you see the budget. This is an expensive looking movie. It's well made. It's got Mm -hmm. high production values. The cinematography is pretty impressive. They clearly shot it on real ships that were built for this movie yeah. on open water. It's quite a spectacle. You find out pretty quick. It starts in a little indoor scene, but then right away she jumps on a horse and is riding across a sandbar in this sparkling blue surf as the sun is setting and a giant wooden ship is sailing on the horizon. And you're like, damn, okay, this is the real deal. This is no VFX here. Let's talk about that opening scene a little bit because I found it a little strange. So we come upon a gentleman in bed, clearly mm-hmm. post-coitus, yes. and Morgan Adams, are hero is there and she's like whatever the pirate version of smoking a cigarette is i don't know just like (laughs) relaxing and he's like aha i know who you are and now i'm going to take you prisoner and she's like aha i knew you knew who i was already and I took the bullets out of your gun, so joke's on you. And I'm like, well, that's the guy, guy still got laid though, right? Well, <laughs> how mad is he really? He shouldn't be mad. And I think that was her whole deal was getting laid too. So like they got what they needed, but she foiled his plans to take her hostage, which I like the writing at the top. It's a lot. And right away there's a monkey and I took your balls jokes and a bunch of corny Hollywood shit in there. But okay, they did what you're supposed to do, which is have what you might call a save the cat moment, a scene that's slightly out of the main storyline where you introduce the hero and just prove that they're clever and resourceful. And then like cleverly, it ties into the big action of the movie, which is her buddies come to collect her. And they're like, where were you? Your dad's been looking for you. And he got caught by Dog Brown, his supposed brother, who's now trying to kill him. Which they, the movie can't really decide if that's really his brother or not. There's like lines that both support and refute that storyline a little bit. Yeah. He's certainly a shitty ass brother. He's killing every <laughs> one sucks. of his, he kills his three <laughs> other brothers, right? One of them him, he's yeah. killed off, off screen before we even meet him. He kills Black Harry on screen, or at least he forces Harry to walk the plank and jump to his death with an anchor tied to his leg. It seems like a waste of an anchor. I know. I mean, the guy's still going to drown if you don't put the anchor on him. He can't swim. His hands yeah, are his hands are tied. <laughs> he's got one peg leg. They could have put like a little... <laughs> Tie a small pebble to him. He's still going to drown. And like, how many anchors does the ship have? Could they really afford to waste one now? But who knows? This is big drama. They got to go big each time. Dog Brown's slightly more villainous than the last Frank Langella villain we saw on the podcast where he was the Cleveland Browns GM and his big crime was wanting to draft a quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. Yes, that was pretty evil. And pretty villainous behavior. Yeah. He's the one who made his, he made his GM meet him in a closed water park for a cup of coffee. Yeah. He probably had to drive to, because what, the Browns are in Cleveland, but there's no way that water park's in Cleveland. There was definitely Cedar Point, like an hour outside Cleveland. So oh, okay. on the busiest pretty... day of Kevin Costner's year, he has to fucking drive around so Frank Langella can make a point. That's right up there with making your brother walk the plank. Equally bad. But Frank Langella luckily has done nothing bad aside from that. He's convincing as a bad dude. 
Maybe we know why. He's convincing us in the real world. <laughs> Even lately, God, the guy's must be so old now and he's getting himself thrown off of movie sets for just being an ass. And Oh yeah, I think all the bad things about him are lately. Like I think okay. everyone thought he was just like a charming old guy until a year ago or whenever yeah. it was. He got kicked off of, of Mike Flanagan production, The Fall of the House of Usher. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that just came out or it's not even out yet. That's still in production. He's interesting in this. He's, Dude, he's not bad. He's pretty good. There's a lot yeah. of bad ADR in this movie though that undermines the performances, I would say. I would agree with you there. And I know you're very sensitive to bad ADR, so this must have been really painful. I didn't notice it as much until- This movie is littered with it. You pointed it out and then I started to notice. I'm like, that's why the dialogue feels- I mean, the dialogue is not great in this movie and it feels worse because it's all just badly looped. I, I think you do lose something of the performance when you have these people re-record their lines in a studio. Like it's, It should be a last resort, but it seems like they were just re-recording the entire movie. I guess it takes a certain amount of skill to really recapture that vibe and they didn't do it. Like you get why they didn't get live audio because the scenes are outdoors and there's cannons going off and they're riding horses and crazy shit's happening. But still like you got to simulate that action and the lines feel red over they're almost like narration right. at times. Yeah. And you know what? Not that I give the movie any slack for that, but I'm sure the post-production because Coralco was going under and probably gave them no money because they already were so far over oh, budget for yeah. production. Like I'm sure post-production was a fucking disaster and they were rushed and or had no money. So it was done on the most shoestring of budgets. Yeah, in post-production, there was no time to go big anymore. That's probably where a lot of that comes from. But it is very noticeable that the ADR is shit in this movie. And the lines are tough. And now you said you really like Gina Davis in this. I am torn how I feel. And it might be because I felt she had more trouble handling the weird dialogue with how stilted it was. And it detracted from her performance for me. I think what I liked about her in this movie is that she's like through and through a fuck up and they never really feel the need to sanitize her, which I think is a very Hollywood idea, especially with a female in a leading role that maybe would be played by a man in, in a similar movie of a similar scale. They just let her be a drunk fuck up throughout the entire movie. And I respected that. And I think I found her character a little more captivating because they weren't trying to play this like redemptive hero arc on her. Like she's doing all this for money and that's relatable because like they didn't, they didn't take that extra step to give her a deeper meaning. I like that read of her and I can totally see why that made her more sympathetic to you. I think those scenes where those things were played didn't sink in as well for me. I know what you mean at the beginning. She is just a drunk for a minute and drowning her sorrows and has to be dragged into becoming more responsible. And it's like they almost gave her a character arc because there's that one telling piece of setup is that she got her dad killed, right? She decided she had to go to town and fuck around with some dudes who may have been French and may have been Spanish and the accent switched back and forth in the middle of the scene. And, <laughs> and for that dalliance, she got her dad worried. He went out wandering the hills and he got caught by his brother. Like what are the odds you're going to run across her? Just if somebody goes hiking, <laughs> do you just go hiking in like a similar trail? Like I'll probably see them here. Yeah. Who knows cell phone. where Black Harry got caught by dog. But anyway, so it's a setup for a big arc. Like she was reckless. She was into sex drugs and alcohol and it got her dad killed and then she has to learn responsibility. But actually she does not have to learn responsibility. She just has to no. race to a treasure. That's all she has to do in this movie is get right. to the treasure first and secure the bags, which she does in the end. So, But not alone. Matthew Modine. We started to talk about it's him. Shaw. Yeah. <laughs> he is good. Like he, despite the fact he is reading his action lines where he's piloting a runaway carriage through a town being bombarded with cannonballs, he is reading quippy, dry, quiet <laughs> jokes. Like <laughs> quiet, yeah. man, in the midst of these seeds as this repartee with Morgan. But he pulls them off. I liked every one of his deliveries, despite the fact that they were so weird and out of place. That sequence you're describing is a sticking point for me because let's just, <laughs> for the people who haven't seen this movie, which I assume is all of you, let's run through what happens here. They're on a carriage. They're coming to a low bridge. Morgan jumps or gets onto the high bridge. Or Yes. She gets, fuck, this is a hard thing to explain. So the carriage is going under this low bridge. Morgan jumps up onto the bridge rather than stay on the carriage. But she doesn't like get up and get right into a sprint. She's no. like having Pratt falls and spinning around and going at a pretty leisurely pace and still somehow fucking catches up to the carriage, which is at a full sprint the entire time. Like the whole thing is very bizarre. The physics don't add up, although the scene is in slow motion. So you can't really pull out the stopwatch and figure out how that was supposed to work. But yeah, she's carriage goes like under this archway. And then the second floor, there's some kind of shop with ladies like powdering their faces. And like she's, a bazaar. Yeah, yeah, she's bumping into them and powder is flying and ladies are gasping in horror. And then 
she comes out the window on the other side, does maybe the only really good stunt in the movie where she tumbles through the window, does a full somersault and lands in the seat of the carriage. And I'm like, okay, that was the one stunt that worked. She had to be running like 30 miles an hour to do that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There was a gap in the space time continuum that allowed her to do that. Um, Speaking of powdering their faces, we have some secondary villains in this movie besides Dog Brown. We have Governor Ainsley and his little lackey, Trotter, Captain Trotter. And these are like the people I can never take seriously as bad guys in a movie because they are wearing the dumbest looking fucking wigs yeah. with like the curly wigs, the heavy pancake face makeup yep. with the bright red cherry lips, but on the middle of their lip in that weird way that they do sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's weird. And like, they're just the least intimidating dudes ever. And they also, they add absolutely nothing to the story. Like you could cut them from this movie entirely and it wouldn't be any worse. They have a vendetta against Shaw because he steals from all the ladies at this party they're at. And that's why he gets arrested. But you could have just had him already locked up like this mysterious prisoner and it wouldn't really change anything. You absolutely could have. They spent a whole scene introducing these side characters. Not even, not to mention there's already going to be rafts full of side characters because each pirate, Morgan and Dog, have their own crew. So there's all kinds of first mates and people that we're going to have to track. And then there's this whole set of people in town and it's okay. So we're setting up Shaw. But then to me, Shaw, unfortunately, like I said, I wanted more of Modine. He's kind of a side character. He spends so much of this movie locked up in chains in three different places, three different points in the movie. He's locked away. He's like a damsel in distress. Would you call that for a man? Dude in distress. He is a um, dude in distress. Which is a fun flip. Like I, I like that, that they kept that separation or that relationship between Morgan and Shaw. But it does mean that this very fun character is off screen a lot of the time or kind of hobbled and sidelined. You've been talking to Michael Douglas because he wanted to play Shaw until oh, he, yeah. hold on a second, you keep sidelining <laughs> no, this character. That's right. No, he was absolutely right. He saw exactly what was coming to Modine and Modine was like, I'll take it because I, I can still get something out of this role. Yeah, I think this role makes a lot of sense for someone like Matthew Modine. I think it makes a lot less sense for like Daniel Day-Lewis yeah. or Tom Cruise. Get your fucking head out of your ass, Rennie Harlan. Tom Cruise ain't working with you. He would have to absolutely rewrite the movie to be something else. And to be fair, his stated goal of trying to make Gina Davis work as an action hero, you can see him commit to it. It's there in the relationships. It's there in how she's front and center and all these scenes. It's there in her fighting. One of the things I like about this movie is that her sword fighting is actually good. You can tell they invested the time and effort to make her physicality credible in this movie. And I have to give them kudos for achieving that. Yeah. One of my notes towards the end of the movie, because there's a lot of fucking extended sword fights in this movie. I said, the choreography is not great, but they definitely saved the best choreography for Morgan. Mm -hmm. They wanted her to feel formidable. And I think they achieved that. Yes. That's a great observation. That's exactly what I was picking up on too. And then Modine, I guess, didn't need as much help because we mentioned in the monologue, he was already an experienced fencer. So mm -hmm. he had a good handle on, because pirate sword fighting and fencing. I think it's a real genre of sword fighting is pirate sword fighting, but you know what the fuck I'm talking about. Like with a cutlass, like they kind of function the same way as a fencing sword. I'm with you on that. I don't know the difference. We talk like we're experts. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Sabers, cutlasses, all that shit. Yeah. But I did want to shout out one of the unintentional laughs I got from this movie is when they're in Port Royal bidding on Shaw and this guy looks at a wanted poster that might as well have been the leprechaun from that news story. Do you remember that news story from like 10 years ago? No. Maybe even more where like this this drawing of a leprechaun and then it's like the most basic ass drawing we're gonna have to put it in the show notes what i'm writing down right now <laughs> show notes leprechaun because it's just like there's no detail in her face it looks nothing like gina davis and then this guy like hits his friend <laughs> he's like, look it's her i was like really you fucking recognized her from that first of all she's dressed like an aristocrat at this auction so she's not even dressed like a pirate and this drawing could have been of literally any white lady in the world <laughs> and it would have looked more like somebody than gina davis like <laughs> you know what my explanation is that soldier <laughs> didn't get a lot of action from women. He spent many long nights looking at that drawing and fantasizing to himself, what if I meet the famous pirate Morgan Adams? And then he got to meet her. You know that famous tweet, like guy who's only ever seen Chappie watching his second movie? I'm getting a lot of Chappie vibes from this. It's like <laughs> yeah. guy who's only ever seen Morgan Adams looking at his second woman. I'm getting a lot of Morgan Adams vibes from this. <laughs> well, he did. He got vibes and they paid off. Long hair, eyes, ears. That's definitely her. <laughs> her. Who else could it be? Oh, man. But the Port Royal set is pretty impressive. They built this functioning town, really. Again, you can see the money. And then they went real big Hollywood with it. Port Royal has a characteristic that you expect of video games. There's a lot of red barrels on the streets yeah. of Port Royal. And when you shoot <laughs> cannons at red barrels, everyone knows that they explode in flames. Did and, they just uh, have barrels of gasoline in Jamaica around this time in history? I don't know. And as a lot of people point out who talk about this movie, you're the captain of the British Navy ship. Your job is to guard Port Royal. You see a famous pirate lady escaping down the street in a carriage. 
and you decide to turn all the guns of your gigantic man of war <laughs> on your own town, like all he yeah. succeeds in doing is blowing up one whole street there, maybe wasn't the best way to catch a thief. He's going to have a very upset city controller he's yeah. going to have to answer to in a couple of years. When they finally repair the town, he's going to get a bill. On my second watch, they cut back to him and they give him one reaction shot where he's like, oh no. <laughs> like when he kind of like he sees what he just did. So sometimes for a few moments, the movie is self-aware of its ridiculous extravagances. Also, what kind of aim do you have? Like you're going to kill a majority of your citizens before you catch Gina Davis running through exactly. this town. Never mind the property damage, just the casualties involved. Yeah. Are catastrophic. It's quite an approach. It's something I would have expected from Dennis Hopper's villain in, in Waterworld. Exactly. It doesn't really fit the character here who's about like a law and order type of guy. Yeah, this was not a post-apocalyptic Mad Max type guy. Just watching the world burn. Do you want me to walk through the middle part of the movie or is there anything else from the section we didn't cover? No, let's see what happens next. All right. I bet somebody's going to go looking for some treasure, Ooh. but I can't be sure. At her next port of call, Morgan approaches her uncle Mordecai to ask him to team up and use his piece of the map to help search for the gold. A dog arrives and a fight erupts, during which Mordecai is killed. Morgan escapes with a bullet wound and Shaw manages to snatch up Mordecai's hidden map segment. Back at sea, Shaw uses his skills as a pretend doctor to operate on Morgan's wound and romantic sparks fly. But Dog is in hot pursuit. Later, Morgan finds Shaw sneaking into the captain's quarters and matching his stolen piece of map with hers. After learning what Shaw figured out about the location of the island, Morgan locks him in the brig. But then Morgan's crew stages a mutiny, setting her and a few loyal men adrift at night in a heavy storm, just as Shaw escapes and dives into the turbulent waves. Luckily, they're close to the destination, and by morning, everybody has washed up one way or another on Cutthroat Island. Shaw, he's got a little bit of a Chris Dunch moment here. He's like, I know how to operate on people. Just give me some rum and a knife. I'll get that fucking bullet out and just starts like stabbing around. It's weird, that whole bit, because I think he admits right after that he's not really a doctor. Yeah. At that point, you could have believed that he had had some real doctor training. And then he operates and he's like, oh, I was making it up. But you got the bullet out. <laughs> I was like, he did fine. They didn't play it up like pure slapstick, like he's a total fuck up. Is it the Three Stooges try to perform surgery? It's not one of those. It was just like a little aside. I'm like, what, what, wait a minute. I don't feel like this movie has a lot of respect for medical professionals to be like, you could pretend it'll be fine. He was a smart guy. He was a smart, he did actually speak Latin. So there is that. That's true. That part of him wasn't fake. So he had something and he knew all the right, like he knew the shtick, how to talk about where he's studied in this and trained in that. So he was somehow educated. So you didn't feel so bad about him pretending to be a doctor because at that point all doctors were pretend doctors nobody knew what the fuck they were doing yeah it's that famous tweet <laughs> you got ghosts in your blood why don't you go do cocaine about it <laughs> but yeah i guess the term con man wasn't popularized yet but that's essentially what he is and like con men for as much as people say it's their criminals are taking the easy way out it seems way more stressful than just getting a real job yeah. like it seems way harder to pull off and way more stressful I give con men a lot of credit yeah but we jump right into another extended battle scene after the last extended battle scene like this is weird pacing didn't you feel that the whole fight with dogs crew is too soon after the Port Royal kerfuffle. It started to be exhausting. And that was a close quarters tavern brawl kind of thing. And yet also ends with explosions. This movie loves explosions, man. Okay, you just had the big horseback and cannon fire fight. Okay, well, this is going to be another kind of pirate cliche. There's some chandeliers. There, there's some sword battling. We already did the pulley trick where they cut like the counterweights and that's go true. up in the air, which is another big pirate cliche. But yeah, we there's still a few that we haven't seen yet at this point. Yeah. Yeah, in this scene, they cut the chandelier cord and the big chandelier comes crashing down, except this chandelier explodes into a fireball. Wait a minute. There was like a dozen candles around the edge of this thing. What exploded? Uh, I think it was a Tesla chandelier. They got oh, into the, uh, the furniture business. Oh, that, would, that would explain it. And then Morgan's men show up at the end to rescue her from this fight. They run up outside and they've got their flintlock kind of pirate guns, except they're wheeling them in the Rambo style from the hip and they're firing off what appear to be incendiary <laughs> grenades because they go through the windows of this tavern and just fire erupts out of there. Yeah, it's pretty rad, but it's, it makes no fucking sense. <laughs> For all the cool historical shit they do with the settings and the costumes, they just get the end of every scene. They're like, it's fire time. Let's blow shit up. They're like fanning the hammer, but on a blunderbuss. Fucking Doc Holliday. The biggest gun you've ever seen. Pretty insane. But then there's some, there is some fun stuff in the scene. I liked Dog's choice of torture device. He just pulls like a big mean looking fish out of a barrel. And is yeah. like, I guess I'll make this fish bite you. He's really grasping here, but it works. There was some good fish or were they eels? I felt like they were eels maybe, which is even more creepy. I thought they were big to be eels, but I don't know a lot about eels, to be honest. Yeah. We'll call back to the shrieking eels, perhaps, of Princess Bride fame. These eels didn't oh, shriek, perhaps. but they were still ugly as hell. Those eels were even bigger, so these were modern. 
lot of steals, I guess, if that was your reference. Maybe we can research the Shrieking Heels more in the next month or so. Let's do that. And then Shaw's back in chains, like we mentioned, kind yeah. of sidelined again by the end of this whole scenario. And this is literally the midpoint of the movie. So this is a weird thing, the way we divided this up into acts made sense to us. Because at the end of this, it's a new morning, they end up on Cutthroat Island. You're like, okay, that has got to be the end of the second act. And now we're just racing to the finale. But it's the fucking middle of the movie. It's the one hour mark in a two hour movie. I was shocked how much movie was left <laughs> when they got to Cutthroat Island. Think about, and I don't want to draw too many comparisons to Pirates of the Caribbean, mm-hmm. the first one, The Curse of the Black Pearl, because that movie's trying to do something else. But when they get to the haunted cursed island at the end of that, like that's the end of the movie. They have some sword fights. You see that Jack Sparrow is really also a ghoul. And then the movie wraps up pretty shortly after that. This movie is fucking dragging on this island. And it's a great looking island, but it's not super interesting to look at. There's no structures on it, really. Just walking through the forest. Yeah, they really <laughs> draw out. I guess we'll get to a lot of the drawing out stuff because that's what the whole next act is. It's the final hour of the movie. But it's funny because the action is really propulsive at this point because they're like, obviously, we got to get to Cutthroat Island. So all this dramatic stuff happens. I actually found that really fun because like we said, Shaw double crosses Morgan. She turns against him after they had that little romantic surgery moment. <laughs> she turns on him again. She's no, you're <laughs> just trying to steal my gold. I'm locking you up. And I then a gold. huge... Oh, can you <laughs> drop that in there? Sure. We can always drop it. I love gold. <laughs> we did use that at some point, right? Oh, it was oh, Cowboys yeah. and Aliens. When they were yeah, I have that. So you should have it on your soundboard. I do. I love gold. So their relationship reverses. A huge storm hits. Her crew, there was that one guy who was threatening to try to become the captain before. Now he really mutinies. Everything goes wrong. They're set adrift. Shaw is diving into the waves. We don't know if he's going to drown. So it's really dramatic. And I thought, oh, this is fun. Beats are hitting one right on top of each other. Makes for a really exciting thing. And then this quiet moment where it's morning and we all look around and say, it looks like we've made it safely to Cutthroat Island. And then just like the mechanical work through of the third act. And it is not super interesting. Like for as much time as it takes for them to get to the gold, there's not a ton of interesting stuff going on. All that kind of comes later. And I guess they try to add some intrigue with the Mr. Reed character moment, but it doesn't yeah, really work. That's true. Reed has a big turning point at this end too, because it's in that same sequence aboard the ship where she calls Shaw a rat for trying to use her map and find his way to the gold. And no sooner does she kick Shaw out of her captain's quarters than Mr. Reed, who we haven't even mentioned because he doesn't matter worth a damn in this movie. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. He's a journalist traveling with the pirates to write about them for newspapers back in London is essentially his character. Yeah, exactly. Which is like more of a stock character from Westerns, right? Where there's the guy writing the Penny Westerns. Unforgiven. Yeah. yeah. That was literally the character in Unforgiven. All right. Well, let's bring it home. Here's the third act. The next morning, Morgan sees the dog's ship has also arrived on Cutthroat Island. So she plots to steal dog's third and final piece of the map. In actuality, Shaw steals it before Morgan can even get there. But shortly afterwards, she finds Shaw trapped in quicksand and she saves him in return for handing over the third piece. Now working together, Morgan and Shaw find a hidden cliffside cave full of gold. But when they attempt to climb back out of the cave with the treasure, Dog is waiting for them. Dog gets the gold while Morgan and Shaw are sent plunging into the rocky surf below and are separated. When Shaw recovers alone, he's captured by the troops of Governor Ainsley, who has made a deal with Dog and the mutineers to split the bounty. As the two pirate ships set sail back to Jamaica, Morgan retakes her ship from the soldiers and her mutinous crew and comes alongside Dog Ship for an epic final battle. Amidst the thunder of cannons and the clashing of pirate sabers, Morgan kills Dog, frees Shaw, and recovers the massive bounty of gold which she shares with her happy crew. Yeah, so a lot of this third act hinges on the Mr. Reed character that we were talking about a little bit, but that character sucks and nobody gives a shit. He's this little nebbish who's, he's having Ooh. his little he's having a little character arc and you're just constantly like I don't care he was never anybody <laughs> so he's he struck a deal with the devil and then he regrets it by the end but it's like okay yeah we regretted it right away he, he regrets it because the devil side lost I don't think he would have had any misgivings if it would have went another way or we don't know enough about him to care but we had to watch him experience his feelings and lead us through all this stuff it was just way too much that's where they went too deep on the subplots and characters he is responsible for my other big unintentional laugh of the movie, which is when okay. he turns a corner with Shaw and they've got the map, but then bang, the governor and dog are there waiting for them. And Shaw is put into handcuffs and we're all sitting there. Yeah, obviously Reed tipped them off and that's why they're betraying him. But like, even though we know that from the movie telling us when Reed sends out the coordinates, right. it's also pretty obvious that because he's got like a shitty grin on his face this entire time. He's not in handcuffs, but Shaw is. But then like a minute after,
after they put Shaw in handcuffs, he's like, and in case you were wondering how we knew, your beloved Mr. Reed told us. We're like, yeah, we fucking know. But then Shaw turns and like attacks Reed like he just figured it out. Like, are you a fucking he idiot? Just, how did you not know that? Out. Yeah, this is the guy that just gleefully led you into an ambush. Come with me, Mr. Shaw. Make him sound like a sprightly little fellow who's clicking he his was, heels about. He was acting weird. He was yeah, very he was. strange. But yeah, Shaw was a little bit clueless. Shaw's the last person to realize who's betraying who at this point. It's hilarious. In my mind, it was because he had the same feeling that I had. Is like, no way. This guy. They did not give a whole fucking subplot <laughs> to read. They gave this guy a character arc. I didn't even remember his name. It was a shock to all of us. I used this reference about another movie recently when we were talking about the Frighteners, but like Reed feels like the protagonist of his own movie. It's happening yes. elsewhere and it just like briefly intersects with Cutthroat Island. And yeah, he feels like somebody else's hero, but not ours. Certainly not ours. And then I don't know how much in depth you want to get on the rest of the movie because it's like we said, this is a very by the numbers pirate thing. There's even fucking quicksand involved. You can't get there's more a, cliche. There's a quicksand scene for no reason in the middle of the woods. There's Shaw. Oh, he's waist deep in quicksand and it's a whole very old fashioned kind of a device. But they spend a lot of time negotiating that. And even that's weird because the whole thing is whispered. And I'm like, they're trying to do jokes, but they're trying to whisper, I guess, because they're hiding from dogs, men, but it didn't really play. So that feels like a whole bunch of time wasted. And then there's all this time like trudging down, going through the cave. There's two minutes where he's slipping on some rocks and almost falling and she's pulling him back. And I'm like, okay, you guys get to the goal. Like I, right. it feels like they're trying to make it more hard earned because you actually, all of a sudden you're there and you're like, oh, this is it. This is Cutthroat Island. This is the goal. And so they're like, they throw in a little extra. We better make it harder, make it slippery on the way to the gold. But it's like, okay, it's, it still feels cheap. You should have just gotten this right there. To your point about them, like whisper shouting in the quicksand, actually before he broke it big as an actor, Kyle Chandler was the acting coach for Cutthroat <laughs> oh. Island. So he was just off screen being like, no, you got to whisper more. You got to whisper shout. That explains it. They weren't even, they didn't take his coaching well because they were whisper whispering. Okay? Just I, whispers. Yeah. I could have used a whisper <laughs> shout there to just bring it up one notch. Could have called the section of the movie Sweet Nothings. So here's the thing. This whole island section, finding the treasure, which you know should be a big part of the movie about finding treasure. It's just the setup. And you're like, you can tell the filmmakers are like, we've got to get to the battle. We're going to have two giant pirate ships that we built and we're going to have them fire all their cannons at each other point blank. And every guy we hired to wear a pirate outfit is going to chop another guy with a sword and we're getting it all on camera. And that's the payoff the director is itching for. And it's okay. What did you think of the big battle? My brain shuts off at these big battles when they go on too yeah. long or there's too many of them in one movie. And that was the effect here. Luckily, Cutthroat Island is interested in keeping me invested because they drop in a lot of unintentional humor. There's one scene where Dog is like dangling Morgan off of the mast. He goes, you don't have to die because now he's trying to convince Morgan to join him, which was mm -hmm. like, that's a new wrinkle. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know about that until now. And she goes, but you do. And then you think she's got a trick up her sleeve or she's going to turn the tables on him somehow. But nope, he just drops her like 30 feet and she just falls. <laughs> I was like, oh, the way she said it, I thought like she secretly had the upper hand somehow. But right. no, she's just fucking she's about to play. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious for reversal. It does seem a little bit unintended. She, she broke three ribs. Oh, that was her big plan. You know? <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. It's such a weird thing. Most of the quips in the battle are of that 80s, 90s action hero variety where they're like dry jokes where the hero does have the upper hand when they say something stupid and corny. Right. Like when she finally defeats Dog, she with a big smile on her face says, bad dog, and shoots him with a cannon. And I was just <laughs> like, oh no, oh no. Shockingly, the cannonball does not explode when it makes contact with dog's skin like everything no. else in this movie. And doesn't tear through him. He cradles it against his belly as he is slowly pulled by wire through a series of bulkheads and out the back of the ship. One of the, again, there's a bunch of, they spent a bunch of money to do real stunts, practical stunts, and some of them are really good. Like the ship's firing cannons at each other. But like you said, you dropped a little hint in the monologue where you're like, the director had three cameras rolling at all times. It makes sense. You're doing a big stunt. You can only do it a couple times. Those scenes, obviously, yes, have multiple camera angles. The problem is the decision making. There's always two angles that look good. The ships are broadsiding each other with cannons. Looks fantastic. There's one camera that's swinging through and creating all this motion. And then there's a third camera where the ships are like planted stock still and look totally fake and corny. And they show yeah. the third shot. And it's just like that with the dog thing too. They show one where it looks really corny. There's a shot where Morgan and Shaw make their final dive to safety just as the ship is about to blow up. 
And yeah. they would have been incinerated, by the way, because the explosion happens like three seconds before they jump. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's totally unrealistic Hollywood action bullshit. But also they take one shot of it where you can just very clearly see the stuntmen's faces. Like it's not at all those actors. Morgan has a full beard. <laughs> it's really corny. There's all these shots where like, oh, you had the good shots, but somehow he's like, no, put in that shot too, where it looks terrible and it looks so, so corny. You're like, they sabotage all their hard work. You had another note too, I thought it would be good to discuss about why these battles go on for so long and feel so fatiguing. It's because they're dead set on giving every fucking minor crew member we've ever met, like their hero moment. Yes. That we didn't care just, about. I, yeah. Could not give a shit about any of them except maybe Stan Shaw. He's okay. cool. He's Mr. Glasspool. Yes. With the strange accent. Yeah. And then there's Tattoo Face. There's little Chris Masterson, Danny Masterson's little brother. Like, I don't give a shit about any of these people. The cast is too big. And yeah. Like, they don't all need their little moments. This was an editing thing. It was like, there's this giant pirate battle and there's just chaos aboard both ships. Guys hacking each other to bits everywhere. And it's, yeah, they got every guy. And I don't care, as I wrote in my notes, if Gim Whittle finally gets back at Mr. Snarvins, because who the fuck were those guys anyway? It was like the quartermaster versus the second mate. They had two lines in the movie and it's like, oh boy. None of those none of those words are in the Bible. Did you just say <laughs> Gim Whittle and Mr. Snarvins to me? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> That's what it was like. There wasn't even really beef between these guys, but they acted like <laughs> each one of these pairs of guys had beef and now it was going to finally get settled on the deck of the ship and you had to watch it all go down. And we did have to watch it all go down. It took fucking forever. And then like the movie leaves on a weirdly down note where they have all this money and this one guy's like, man, I am kind of just want to go be a farmer. And everyone's like, fuck you, idiot. You don't get to go be a farmer. We're pirates. Kiss my ass. And then everyone's just like, all right, we're uh, rich now, but we have to keep living this weird lifestyle. <laughs> it gets awkward for a minute because you can't quite tell. To me, uh, Gina Davis as Morgan Adams gives this speech at the end, which is supposed to show her being the magnanimous, well-loved captain of this crew. She's like, we're splitting all this gold equally. You're all rich men. You can do whatever you want. But I bet what you want to do is go find more gold. And then everyone's like, oh, maybe not. And she's like, "Uh uh-oh, did I misplay it? And then they all start laughing. So it's kind of like, oh, they were fucking with her. They were messing with her. But I was like, her speech was weak enough that I was ready to believe. (laughs) Like, no, they all were like, no, thanks, Morgan. And that was fun and all, but we're out of here. Yeah, I think the farming thing was like a ha ha JK, unless that's cool and I can actually go be a farmer. <laughs> exactly. She was like, no, you can't. And he was like, ah, then yeah, I'm with you. Like, yeah. why are you going to? The amount of treasure they got is absurd. There's no reason to go out and rob people now. Yeah, I get it. That's again another one of those obligatory pirate themes of, oh, it's never enough gold and the adventure is what calls us to this life. It's not the that sea we... is me true lover, yar. <laughs> yeah. Um, and all that. But you can still go fucking drive your boat around. Just like pirates aren't good people. I know. Like, if you're doing it out of obligation and necessity, that's one thing. But just go chill somewhere. Stop being a fucking dick all the time. Yeah, it would everyone. have been more satisfying. I'm just thinking to see them enjoying the gold. They literally, they don't go ashore and have a nice meal or right. anything. They're just like, let's go to Madagascar next for the sequel. Let Mr. Glasspool go get a steak. I don't know. Yeah. These guys They've earned are it. sick of fish. And bananas, man. They got so many bananas loaded on that ship. So that's Cutthroat Island. It's kind of a nothing movie. For as expensive as it was, for as a historical footnote it is, it's a very middling movie. It's got real modest goals that it wants to achieve in its storytelling. And I think it it mostly does, but you have to ask yourself, what was the fucking point? Yeah, it's kind of paint by numbers. There's a moment when she discovers the goal that she has this, what's supposed to be meaningful personal moment for her, where she says, Harry, I found it. She's alone and she says out loud to herself, Harry, I found it. Harry, of course, can't hear her because he's fucking dead because of her. Yeah, but at that point, I was like, wait a minute, who's Harry? Was this whole movie about <laughs> Harry? Oh, is that her dad who she calls Harry instead of dad? It was like hollow. It was like they almost reached out to try to touch an emotional thread in it, but really Really was just like, no, this is just race for the gold and then keep racing, I guess. Morgan's grandparents had a great sense of humor. They named one guy Mordecai, one guy Harry, <laughs> one guy Dog. What was the fourth brother? We ever even find out the fourth brother's name? Oh, I forgot. It, it probably gets said at some point where Dog's like, I killed Richard or whatever for his map. <laughs> It's either Richard or Bartholomew. Like it's something, it's either something (laughs) super normal, like Harry or something very exotic, like Mordecai. But they knew Dog was a piece of shit because the dad- Used to be. (laughs) Slick back hair, white Lamborghini, sloppy steaks at Trefani's. He's a real piece of shit. (laughs) 
But the parents knew that. I mean, babies know that. But in this, <laughs> this case, his parents knew that because he's the only one who didn't get his own piece of map. His dad found all the fucking gold in the world, hid it on Cutthroat Island, divided the map in three when he had four boys and gave it to everybody but Dog. And Dog reasonably had to go start killing his brothers to, to collect his family treasure. It really is a question of what came first. Was Dog always a piece of shit or was Dog like, fuck this family? Yeah. You know, I didn't get a piece of map. I'm going to start killing everyone. That was a weird plot point. And I was confused, like you said, the whole time. Does that, does that mean he wasn't a real brother? Who knows? It's not important. He's he's not. He makes so many references to Morgan about he's not family like us. He like He doesn't get it. You're like, but are you really? You're Italian. I mean, these other guys aren't Italian. <laughs> he does stick out. Yeah. And he doesn't look like the rest of the family. It's weird seeing Frank Langella like kind of young. I always assumed at his youngest, he was like 58. Me too. I figured that's where he started. He was in a Dracula back in the day when I was little. I got to look that one up. I like describing vampires as Draculas. So when you, I don't know, it's really <laughs> it's, tickles me. It is, a, it is a cute thing, but he was literally playing Dracula. He <laughs> wasn't playing, just any he's vampire. The guy. He's got a Dracula look to him. Him and Chris yeah. Lee kind of look like they could be related. That's true. They got a vibe. You can see that. Especially in this movie with the goatee, because the goatee was always like Christopher Lee's go-to facial hair. That's right. RIP to a real one, Chris Lee. Yeah. Not Frank Langella. He seems like he sucks. Yeah. Well, that's Cutthroat Island. Do you want to hear where some of the other parties involved went after this? Because I feel like lately we've been saying, like, this didn't really hurt anyone's career. But no, this one, this one actually This did. one kind of did. Oh, okay. Let's hear what happened. All right. So let's start with Rennie. Good old Renfro. I assume that's what Rennie is short for. We mentioned what he had done up to this point. And then he made the long kiss goodnight, which I would characterize as a flop. It made $96 million against $65 million budget. So it didn't double its budget. It made back its production budget and a third. Yeah. I don't know. Math isn't my thing. But okay. it definitely lost money, I think with those numbers. Also, I'm not sure why The Long Kiss Goodnight cost $65 million. It's a good movie, but it's kind of like a tight little thriller. I don't think you really see that budget on screen personally. There's no exploding ships, right? No. Nary a pirate ship explodes in that movie, unless I'm really misremembering. So next up was Deep Blue Sea, which is incredible and I deeply love it, but it wasn't exactly like a massive hit. It probably made a little bit of money, but Deep Blue Sea fucking rules. I highly okay. recommend it. And then he made a Sylvester Stallone huge bomb called Driven, which I vaguely remember existing, but I never saw. I think it's like an F1 movie. Weird, yeah. I but that, that lost a fuck ton of money. And then he made the movie Mindhunters, which we talked about a couple weeks ago because it was written by Kevin Broadbin, who wrote Constantine. Oh, so okay. That was one of the movies he made. Again, not Mindhunter, the show from David Fincher, and also not Manhunter, the excellent Hannibal yeah. Lecter movie from Michael Mann. Just some fucking movie called Mindhunters. No one knows what it's about. It doesn't really okay. exist, I'm pretty sure. He was starting to fade at this point. He'd had a couple clunkers in a row. And then he had this whole <laughs> Exorcist 4 debacle which I think we've, we have briefly touched on in the past, but Paul Schrader had made a movie called Exorcist Dominion that was finished in the tank, probably needed some post-production, but the studio saw it and flipped the fuck out and said, we're not releasing this. They just shelved it forever. Okay. And then had Rennie Harlan make his own version, which flopped and got terrible reviews anyway. So Exorcist 4 probably cost movie studios way more than it was worth because Dominion eventually became available, but also nobody liked that either. So it's like, oh. <laughs> it feels like a lot. It feels like much to do about nothing. Yeah, that's like, two strikes on the same pitch. They swung twice and missed the right. Bugs Bunny style. That's a very apt uh, description. And then he somehow got $70 million to make a terrible Hercules movie called The Legend of Hercules. Oh. This is not the one with The Rock in it from a few years okay. back. This one starred Kellen Lutz, who you might remember as being like seventh build in the Twilight movies. More likely you don't remember at all. Not at all. He played a sex idiot on 30 Rock. It was the first time I heard the term sex idiot, and he played that role well, let's just say. Okay. He had a hit in China, not Kellen Lutz, back to Rennie Harlan. <laughs> oh. So he made a movie in 2016 called Skip Trace, which again feels like a movie poster was made with no accompanying movie. Right, but sure. No, it's a Johnny Knoxville and Jackie Chan action comedy, which sounds okay. It was a big yeah. hit in China, like I said. I mean, it's available in the States. You can find it. I'm not sure if it did get a theatrical release here, but it made enough money. He's working, but it's like low to mid budget slock. A lot of straight to VOD, straight to Redbox stuff. Okay. But he makes like a movie every year. Oh, really? Or less he's he never really stopped working. Yeah. That's an interesting way to have a career. He's also, he's an older guy now too. I think he's in his sixties. Yeah. He's 63, but he also looks like he would wear affliction t-shirts still, if that oh, makes I sense. I see what you mean. He, so he made Skip Trace. That's the Jackie Chan, Johnny Knoxville movie in 2016. But then he made a movie in 2018, movie in 2019, two in 2021, one in 2022. And he's got two more in production. He's really busy, but not with anything that's going to move the needle. He's just paying the bills at this point. He's a gun for hire. Good for Which me. is not the he's worst young. thing in the world to be. Yeah. 
guy. He's younger than I thought. I guess it makes sense because he was age appropriate for marrying Gina Davis at the time. But somehow I thought of him as like an older type marrying a young actress. But no, he got started pretty early. He was making Die Hard 2 at around 30 or something. Yeah, that sounds about right. Also, Die Hard 2 fucking sucks. Just my two cents there. Fair enough. Die Hard with a Vengeance is the far superior movie of that original three. Makes sense. Yeah. The screenwriters were Robert King and Mark Norman. I don't want to spend a ton of time on them because they, they don't really have a lot of noteworthy stuff in, okay. in their filmography. King was a pretty busy screenwriter at the time, but nothing that was a huge hit. He wrote stuff like Under the Boardwalk, Blood Fist, and Speechless. Blood Fist. That sounds like something <laughs> like a nine-year-old was like, I want to write a, a movie. It's going to be called Blood Fist. But a lot of punching. A, this hand gets all bloody from the punches. <laughs> he wrote the Richard Gere movie Red Corner, which I remember liking when I was like 13, but it's a very, it was clearly financed by whatever film studio was most anti-China at the time, because that movie is all about making China look bad and scary and don't ever go there. Yes. Um, I just read about that in a book about China and Hollywood and how that was- uh, Oh, Red Corner specifically was mentioned? It comes up because, yeah, Gear was also aggressively promoting that sort of anti-China sentiment, and it was really like a wrench in the works of Hollywood's efforts to get in with China around that same time. Yeah, it's like really over the top with the anti-China sentiment. I think it works okay as a movie, as it's just like a thriller. And when you don't know enough about the world to analyze the subtext, but mm. I bet if I watched it now, it would just be a bummer. Yeah. Then 2000's Vertical Limit, he also wrote. And then he writes a lot of TV. Okay. He, he has a writing partner, his wife, Michelle, now. He didn't write this movie with her. They weren't together yet, but now that they're married, he created a bunch of shows like Justice, The Good Wife, which is a well thought of show. It's kind yeah, of like a prestige for sure. TV one. And the follow up, The Good Fight. Okay. Uh, Brain Dead, Evil, Your Honor, and The Bite. I've heard of some of those, yeah. but you know, he's making money writing for TV, being a showrunner, things of that nature. But this was the second to last film credit for Mark Norman. He was hired to rewrite the movie, so he took King's script and rewrote it. Okay. Um, his last credit was Shakespeare in Love, the much maligned Oscar winner. Kind of a good credit. Yeah. Weird to go out on that and not try to get some more work. I don't know what happened to him, personally. Who knows? These semi-obscure screenwriters from the 90s don't have a wealth of information on the internet about no. it. I could find out too much. That's not on you. Let's talk about Gina Davis, because if anybody paid the price for the failure of Cutthroat Island, it was Gina Davis, because she was a woman, and end of list. So they were like, we need a scapegoat here. Let's just stop casting Gina Davis and stuff. Yeah, um, we talked bummer. about what she'd done up to this point. Big hits, The Fly, Beetlejuice, Them and Louise, League of Their Own. She had occasional flops, like Earth Girls Are Easy was a flop, but I think people have come around in that movie more so lately. Uh -huh. And uh, Quick Change, which is a Bill Murray directed comedy, which I've never heard of. Wow. That she was in in the 80s. But Interesting. This did a number on her career. She made The Long Kiss Goodnight, which clearly had been greenlit before this movie's box office receipts came in because no way you're giving this duo $65 million to make their movie after this is uh, a. <laughs> yeah. It's known to the public how bad this is going. But she didn't work again until 1999. And then she made Stuart Little, where she plays Stuart Little's like foster mom. And then she made two more Stuart Littles. Those are the only movies she made up until 2009. Wow. She did no non-Stuart Little related film work between the, the years of 1996 and 2009. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I said, I didn't. did you mean to say that like Owen Wilson? Yes, I did. Because I said okay. the first one I didn't, and then I heard myself, and I'm like, that sounds kind of Owen Wilson. -y. Let me go with that. Wow, good, good Owen Wilson. Thing. That's a, that's fucking insane, though. That's crazy. Yeah, for Gina Davis, who's she was a big movie star up to that point. You think of her as just like rock solid movie star. It's weird that she just evaporated in the '90s. She did say in interviews, like she didn't want to blame it all on Cutthroat Island. She thinks part of it was just like being a woman in her 30s in Hollywood, oh. which unfortunately was very much the case then and still is to some degree, but I think we're getting a little better at addressing it. Yeah, that makes sense. There's There seems to be some really good stuff out there for actresses in their 30s, 40s, 50s now, but that wasn't really the case, especially in the 90s. So then she did some TV during those years in the wilderness. She had her own sitcom in the year 2000 called The Gina Davis Show that lasted one season. I can't picture Gina Davis on a sitcom. That sounds weird. I would kind of like to see it. I'm trying to think if I can bring up any image of it and probably I can't, but my brain wants to manufacture what that looked like. When you say sitcom and it's called like the Gina Davis show, that to me, I'm picturing like a multi-camera laugh track live audience show. It makes you think of that. Yeah. With that old fashioned star in the title kind of thing harkens way back. When did she do that? 2000. That seems almost a little bit too early. Like the prestige level of even network style TV has now raised up to where movie stars can come back to TV and 
have it not look like they're slumming it. But maybe that was a little soon to really pull that off. But I feel like nowadays you could do that. Yeah. Back then, I think it kind of it felt like a downgrade for an actor to go to TV. Like in exactly. That, to that degree, especially on not exactly a prestige show. Pretty, pretty light fare. Yeah. Although for the term prestige television didn't exist yet. Sure. Although I guess Sopranos was 99. So it was maybe starting to kind of enter the lexicon. She starred in single season drama Commander in Chief. She has had a recurring spot on Grey's Anatomy from 2014 to 2018. Okay. She starred in an Exorcist show in 2016. I didn't know that was a thing. Weird, and yeah. she had a role in season three of Glow, the dearly oh. departed Glow, like Glow. So in 2009, that was when she broke her movie, Dry Spell. She was the only American actor in an Australian coming of age dramedy called Accidents Happen that never got a distribution deal. So it's not like they were beating her door down with offers here, but it was a foot in the door. Yeah. Then she did voice work in the Studio Ghibli film uh, When Marnie Was There in 2014. I haven't seen that one, but she's- Neither she's, have I. She did a voice work in it for the localization. They always do great at casting the English language voice actors in Ghibli Definitely. movies, I think. Yeah. And then she did mostly direct to streaming stuff, but she was in Ava, which I remember- being a movie. It was a 2020 Jessica Chastain thriller. Where she's like a, an assassin of some sort, I believe. It got a limited release and negative reviews. So it wasn't okay. exactly, you know, a marquee thing. But she's got a role in an upcoming Zoe Kravitz directed film, Pussy Island. I imagine they're going to change that name if they want to get a theatrical release. Although Cocaine Bear is still called Cocaine Bear. That's coming out <laughs> any day now. Who knows? And then she's got, there's a potential awards bait coming of age drama called Fairyland, which she's going to be in. So she seems to be getting her groove back in the film world now, thankfully, which is great. Yeah, that's nice to see. She She's too big a name, too good of an actor to toil in the director streaming stuff. This is good. I'm heartened by hearing about her comeback and I hope it proceeds apace. But fuck this movie for steamrolling her career. Yeah. It's weird too. There's weird things about this movie because you can see Rennie Harlan making sure that she was really the action hero in this, but also he doesn't shoot her in a flattering way. And like, maybe it's sexist to think that she should have been shot in a flattering way when she was a tough fighting pirate. But Matthew Modine looks really handsome and she doesn't look that great. Maybe that's me. And I'm sorry if that's me being rude, but I watched one little press tour thing with the both of them. And she talks about, she's like, Rennie is obsessing over tossling uh, Matthew's hair before the shot to make him look perfect. And, and she's like, what about me? And I felt like I saw that on screen. I don't know if that has anything to do with how this movie did or how she was perceived in it, but that was like a little side note that I felt like she wasn't the glamour star of the film. She was the kind of grungy, hardworking star of the film. I don't think you're out of pocket for bringing it up because think about those Arnold and Sly Stallone and even Bruce Willis movies. As the movie goes on, they shed their clothes till they're in like a tank top and right. their muscles are bulging and the camera tends to linger on them like there, there's always been a little bit of sexualizing the stars of these movies, even when they're men. And maybe that's not what the directors think they're doing, but it's what they're doing when you're just like shooting their bulging muscles the whole time. And right. yeah, she doesn't exactly get that treatment. No, not really. And it's fair. Like those same guys wind up with a face full of bruises and bloody cuts and things. And that's its own form of masculine romanticizing of their physicality, which so it's totally fair to have your female lead put through that same stuff. But I saw, it just struck me because I watched a trailer of Die Hard 2 to refresh my memory on what that movie looked like. And there's shots of Bruce Willis before he gets into the dirty fighting part half of the movie. And he looks so fucking made up and the light is perfect on his face. I'm like, he did not do that to Gina Davis in this movie. There was not, even in the scenes where she was dressed up nice, she didn't look as good as Bruce Willis looked in this trailer. And like Gina Davis is a much more beautiful woman than Bruce Willis is a handsome man. So <laughs> he true. had to do way more work to make Bruce Willis look good than he would have had to do to make his beloved wife at the time beautiful on screen yeah and it's not like he doesn't know how to do that with his actresses because there was like much made about his sexualizing of saffron burrows in deep blue sea when she's supposed to be playing like a very high-powered scientist okay but, interesting you know, she looks like a supermodel the entire time and there's one scene where she strips down for completely nonsensical reasons so yeah it's not like he's immune to that no i guess kind not. of uh, impulse it just, he didn't feel like doing it for his wife there. Yeah, maybe it was one of those cobbler's kids going shoeless deals. Exactly. Okay, so let's talk about Modine a little bit because he was pretty much unscathed by Cutthroat Island. And maybe that's something to do with gender. Who can Could say? Be. Just maybe. But he worked pretty steadily after this movie, mostly in smaller roles. Like he was in smaller movies as one of the leads or he was in big movies as a, as a bit part. I see. But that was his career before this too. So he just went back to doing what he was doing. He played one of the most hilariously inept police officers of all time in The Dark Knight Rises. Oh, I don't know okay. how much you remember about that movie, but he's the guy who keeps calling Joseph Gordon-Levitt a hothead. 
I don't know. He must say the term hothead like 15 times in that movie. <laughs> and he only has seven scenes in the movie. So I don't understand why. They're like, all right, so this guy really hates hotheads. And that's all you need to know about his character. But he's also the guy who leads the entire police force into the tunnels beneath Gotham and gets them trapped down there. Oh. Which is a real storyline that happened in this $200 million movie. The entire Gotham police force is trapped underground because they led every single cop in the city into this tunnels to try to get Bane. <laughs> and he, of course, knew they were going to do that and blows up the tunnel and traps them. That is a very comic book thing to do. But that was Matthew Modine's play in the movie. So I will always remember him for that. But Joseph Gordon-Levitt's a hothead because he wanted to like investigate some stuff. He is a hothead, but Matthew Medina is very sensitive to the temperature of the cranium, obviously. He's always checking his <laughs> officers for fever. Way before COVID, you had to get your forehead scanned before you could come into the precinct. <laughs> but he was in, he played John Scully in Jobs. He had a prominent role in Sicario, Day of the Soldado. If you're keeping track, that's the bad Sicario movie. Yeah. And he will be in the upcoming Chris Nolan movie, Oppenheimer, which is like, except for Avatars 3 through 7, probably like the biggest movie in production right now, I would say. Yeah, that'll be neat to see. And he was the bad guy in Stranger Things, is that? Yeah, he's the human Correct. big bad. He's not the demigorgon. Right. organ. He's like the scientist who was Eleven's uh, like adoptive father slash tormentor. Yes, I remember that from season one. So that was a good, that's a perfect older Modine yeah. part where he gets to be like a cool, creepy older dude. He was offered the role of Goose in Top Gun and he famously said he didn't want to be like a champion of the military industrial complex, which was wow, kind of cool to hear. what yeah. a stand, yeah. He seems like a pretty stand-up dude when you read interviews with him. Like he doesn't, I think he's pretty happy with his standing in Hollywood and he doesn't feel the need to like kiss ass. He just tells it like it is. He's a fun, fun interview to read. If you can come across any with him. And he also had a big role on Weeds, I should point out, which was a oh, show okay. a lot of people cared about, but I couldn't get past like season two. That puts him in an, another spot in the prestige ranks. Frank Langella, we talked a lot about his career during the draft day episode. And even if we didn't, fuck off, you're not going to go check. He's apparently the sex pest. So yeah, he, he's his standing in Hollywood has been reduced. For sure. But he's also super old. What does he care now? I guess not too much. He refused to come out and be like, yeah, I fucked up. I'm sorry. He was just like, no, everyone's a little bitch nowadays. I don't give a shit. Exactly. He was not remorseful at all. He does not care enough to even set things straight or be a nice dude. So fuck him. Yep. Allegedly or something. I don't know. Okay. I don't know where that would fit in there. Allegedly. So that's all I got. Was there any closing thoughts on this movie you wanted to drop on us or did y'all get it out of your system? I wanted to make a little comparison. Like we've said throughout, the movie was too straightforward. It was too by the numbers. It had this nostalgia for simpler movie making times when it was enough just to line up the aspects of a swashbuckling adventure and execute them, which this movie does. But then I'm like, so what made you think that you could do that in the mid 90s? And I'm like, well, Raiders of the Lost Ark did kind of good at digging up old school adventure films and reinventing them. And I'm like, okay, but mm. it's the talent. Uh, I think the difference is. Rennie Harlan ain't, ain't Spielberg. <laughs> he's not Spielberg. He didn't have Harrison Ford and he didn't have enough of it. But it does make you wonder, what are the little differences? Because you're like, you could imagine somebody like him going, I lined up all the stuff that I did what you're supposed to do and it didn't work. But yeah, devil's in the details, I guess. You said it yourself. You called this movie paint by numbers and you're not going to paint the Mona Lisa by numbers. Right. You might make something that looks fine and serviceable, which is what this movie is, by the way. I didn't hate my time watching this movie. It was mostly enjoyable, but it's not memorable. It just comes and goes. And that's the difference yeah. between Raiders of the Lost Ark and this movie is, like you said, the details, the little touches. Rennie Harlan made a fine action adventure, quote unquote comedy. I don't know. There's not that many laughs in this movie, but it keeps being referred to as an action comedy. But it's just, that's all it is. It's fine. The problem is it cost $150 million to make. You know, it's always this movie cost $60 million to make like it was supposed to, and it got a decent marketing push. We probably wouldn't be here talking about it today. That's true. So many of these movies we talk about are just movies that got away from the people involved with making them and it snowballed out of control. And that's clearly what happened here. Yeah. There's no reason this movie needed to be such a to-do. I guess that's the lesson. If you don't have that magical sparkling idea, if you just have like ordinary components you're going to make a movie out of, don't invest in it like you think you found the fucking Spanish gold. Just keep yourself modest, keep yourself humble, and just crank out something that's fun and cheap. Speaking of fun and cheap, next week's movie is neither of those things. Oh, no. We're doing the Michael Keaton is a haunted snowman family drama comedy no thriller? No spoilers. I don't know. He looks creepy. I don't really know what this movie is. It's called Jack Frost. I remember when this movie came out, by the way. Like, I do remember Jack Frost. Trailers and posters and seeing the DVD box cover at West Coast Video, but I've never seen it. We may have a special guest with us for that one. I'm hoping we do, but I okay. will have to double check. Fingers crossed. Snow fingers crossed. Creepy snowman invading the blast zone. For the first and hopefully last time. I don't know how many. I know there's more than one. There was like also a Gary Busey as a haunted like ginger bread man movie that came out around this time oh, called Lord. ginger dead man and i just remember if you went to 
rent one and your parents got confused and got you the wrong one, that would be pretty traumatic. Either way, <laughs> whichever one you were expecting, if you got the other one, you'd be pretty upset. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe to the podcast. We think it helps new listeners find us. I it's hope worth so. a try. It's worth a try. Come on. You can follow us on Twitter at BlastZonePod. Email us, BlastZonePod at gmail.com. Movie suggestions, questions, comments, feedback. We just appreciate hearing from you guys. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time in the Blast Zone. See you next time in the Blast Zone. The Blast Zone. Drop it.